wave. Welcome to Beware Bulldogs. I am your host, Caleb Nail. Along with me is the main guy on this show, Caleb Pletz. He is the host, the host, Caleb Pletz. Mr. Pletz, how are you, man? Yeah, I am doing well. That's a very kind introduction, but um, yes, I'm just along here for the ride with you. And uh, boy, has anything happened since uh, the last time we uh, went live here? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, are you a dad yet? I, am I mean, not. <laughs> oh. just just r- relating to Fresno State news because it seemed like oh, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> it seems yeah, like we. Happened. We we always have really good timing where stuff happens right after we, we record an episode. I think they do it purposefully. They don't want us to be talking about it right after it happened. And it's probably good because the emotions, my emotions always get the best of me. And I will just spew nonsense uh, that I will probably regret later. It gives me about a week to uh, pray about these things and really think about it, consult others that are much wiser than I, and then I can come back and do this. But it would be fun for them to release things on Monday morning so that we could do (laughs) do that. (laughs) What's going on, everybody? If you're on YouTube, comment down below that you're here. We want to know where you're watching from and uh, the beverage you're enjoying uh, during this time, uh, if you're on X, I believe you have to be a paid, a paying subscriber to comment. Not our deal. That's not us. That's Elon. Okay, so talk to Elon. Uh, but I see Bulldogs Bob's here. Robert Perez is here. Uh, what's going on, guys? Uh, congrats on your hosting the next and meeting this week. Sorry, Bob. I'm confused. <laughs> I think that's court, quarterback club. Oh, yes. Got got it. I should. Yes. If you're listening, quarterback club at Givoli Winery, we're bringing back the West Side Quarterback Club. So Wednesday, that I believe is the 27th, um, we are meeting at Givoli Winery, Z-I-V-E-L-I at 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to they're going to be giving us info. Um, so you don't have to be a part of quarterback club to come. We want everybody to show up. Uh, the winery will have wine for purchase and brick oven pizza. So, uh, make sure you make it out there. 6 PM Givoli winery, uh, quarterback club meeting and uh, lots of info. Uh, we can learn what's going on and help support the, the football program. Um, I know Mike Stovall has, uh, is a part of that. You, you may remember former, uh, center for, I believe, David Carr. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be out there and um, you guys can, uh, I don't know, bug him, ask him questions. It's going to be a good time. Wednesday, December 27th of December. Oh my gosh. I am uh, way behind or ahead. Uh, Wednesday, March 27th, 6 p.m. at Givoli Winery. All right. So today we're talking about Fresno State baseball. We get our update in. A little bit of interim well, there, we have an interim basketball coach, so we can talk about that. And then uh, the big news on campus, if you live under a rock, you may not know this, but Terry Toomey and Fresno State have gone their separate ways. So we're going to touch on that as well. Let's start, Caleb, in the baseball world. But first, I should say I got to do my due diligence here, Caleb, and get everyone to head over to the X and... Follow us, Beware underscore Bulldogs. We're on Instagram, Beware of Bulldogs Podcast. And on YouTube, Beware of Bulldogs. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment on the video. The best thing for the video is comments. That helps us out with the algorithm. So comment. Uh, I don't know. Be controversial. I, I Get people going. Um, <laughs> uh, so that helps us out on YouTube as well. We go live Monday nights at 7 p.m. on YouTube and X. And um, we're here to have a good time. All right, Caleb, let's talk baseball. Actually, let, let's hit the red wave real quick first, and then we'll go baseball. Um, yes, Bulldogs, I was talking about quarterback meeting. I'm glad. See, I, I told you I'm not very smart. I, I read goodly. I, I'm, not, I'm not very well-versed in that field, so thank you. Uh, Mendoza D85, who gets hired first, AD or B-ball coach? 
we'll get to that in a second. Uh, <laughs> later on, um, goodbye, Robert Perez says. <laughs> not, he actually, I don't know if you want to sing this, Caleb, but na 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 na. Hey, 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 goodbye. And um, we'll, we'll touch on the basketball and AD stuff at the end. Caleb, let's get to baseball. Baseball had a three game series against Air Force over the weekend. And uh, it went, for the most part, okay. But there is a game, the Friday night game, I'd like to talk about right now because it was the talk on Twitter X for a while there that night. Go ahead. Yeah, overall, disappointing that the dogs lost on Friday night. Overall, series win. Um, you know, they've ended up picking up the Saturday and Sunday games in convincing fashion. Friday, disappointing. We got a really strong start out of Jake Dixon. He went uh, six innings and uh, didn't give up any runs. Struck out eight, only walked one. Um, offense was limited, though. Um, dogs scored on a Grady Morgan home run, and I think Bronco Pepe had the other two RBIs. So, um, yeah, overall limited offense, but it looked like um, you know things were in place to um, you know close it out and get a victory over Air Force, which coming in they were uh, leading the conference uh, conference standing. So this was a huge series. And then seventh, eighth inning, um, or eighth and ninth inning, uh, Vic Ariola gave up a two run shot, and Tommy Hoffy coming in to get the save also gave up a two run homer to, um, you know, let the Air Force Falcons go up four to three. And, uh, you know, the dogs weren't able to get anything across in the ninth inning. So it's a disappointing loss for, for the dogs. Um, you know, after getting a really strong start from Jake Dixon. And, you know, getting enough across to, you know, have a lead, you know, we've been so used to, to Tommy being um, just being solid at the back end. But, um, you know, he, he struggled on Tuesday in the midweek. I think he threw like, I think 27 pitches and kind of labored through the game. And um, I think he, he, I'm not remembering correctly, but uh, he might have given up uh, the loss on Tuesday too. So um, kind of a tough week for Tommy, um, you know, bounced back on Sunday at the plate. I would say he had a strong day on Sunday, but um overall disappointing on friday and uh, i think that there were some questionable calls um uh, <laughs> maybe in favor of air force on friday but um yeah that's for all the fans to bicker about i guess yeah and you know <clears throat> before we get to the two blowout games and some numbers there we i, I we this has been a trend i i guess you could call it a trend now we are just this far away from sweeping teams. And it's been very common throughout the season. We drop one. I would like to see us take the next. I'm, I'm fine with winning two. That is great. It's actually really good. But I think the, the championship teams, they're going to go and they're going to go put, they're going to go put those games away. They're going to win those games, sweeping teams that they should. Now, Huge series win over Air Force as they, like you said, were number one in the Mountain West and were proving to the rest of the fan bases and the Mountain West and baseball teams that, look, we're legit. We're the best here. Um, but I, I want to see us take the next step, and that is winning three games out of a three-game series. I don't know. what Am I asking for too much? I think this team is capable, and I don't think it's that much for – me to ask i think my expectations are in the right place yeah it seems like they're really close to doing that but if you look at the big picture if the dogs are going two and one every weekend that's at least good enough to get them into the mountain west tournament and just mm -hmm. based on his history the dogs are going to have to win the conference tournament to get into um, the ncaa field at the end of the season so at this point, as long as we're in the top four and we're, we're making it to the conference tournament that's really all we need to do and then then we need to get hot at the end and, and win the tournament. But I, I think two and one every week will be good. But yeah, it, it is frustrating when uh, you know our, our starting pitching has been really solid. You know, I pulled up the the Mountain West uh, like leading stats here for the conference, and um, you know Fresno State as a team, you know, was number one in terms of ERA like by a lot, almost by by two runs. Uh, opposing opposing batting average there number one batter struck out their number one you know the most uh you know wins well they are in first place now um so yeah overall i mean the the starting pitching has been really strong uh for this team so 
as long as the bullpen can keep it together at the end of games, then yeah, this, this team's going to be uh, able to, to go far. Another thing that I've noticed, Caleb, about this team, and it's not bad. This is a good thing. <clears throat> when we talk about baseball, you notice there's, there's one name we haven't talked about at all. And that's Murph Gray. Uh, we, I mean, we talk about Rocco Pepe a lot. We talk about Eddie. I mean, we, there's a lot of players on the scene that have been stepping up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a frog in there. Um, they're stepping up. And, you know, we haven't actually got to talk about Murph Gray. He did struggle Saturday um, off the one I, off the top of my head. Um, but, I mean, he's there. He's still there. But, I don't know. Any, any thoughts? I don't know. I was, just, I was just thinking that. I mean, he went one for five on Sunday. So, I mean. Yeah, I mean, Murph, I Murph, Murph has really been struggling at the plate. Granted, the our opponents know how to pitch him just because of how how uh, strong of a season he had last year. So I, I don't think he's getting a lot of great opportunities. But um, you know, on yesterday's broadcast, um, you know, uh, Marsubian and Hosey were both kind of commenting on, you know, they they could see that his approach maybe needed to be cleaned up a little bit at the plate. They mentioned, you know, he's getting way out front on a lot of these pitches. So obviously we, we both aren't hitting coaches, so I, I don't really know <laughs> what that means. But, you know, Murph Mur is hitting under 200, which is uh, definitely below expectations. I'm sure he had for himself and, um, you know, the coaching staff too. So he's struggling, but I mean, he's so talented that I figure it's just a matter of time before things start clicking and he starts putting hits together. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting, though. I mean, there's there's plenty of guys on that bench that are, are fighting for playing time. I mean, we saw the freshman from Bullard, Cam Snyder, um, get a couple of appearances early in the season and played pretty well. I know he got a, got a couple hits in his opportunities. I think he, he even won the Mount West freshman of the, of the week. So when when that's behind him, there's going to be some pressure on the coaching staff to, you know, get a productive bat in there. Um, when it's it's crazy when he's almost the, the, the weak link in the lineup right now, which is almost a good thing because then once he figures it out, it's going to be even better for the offense. But yeah, like like you mentioned, the the additions of Eddie Saldivar and Rocco Pepe, especially, I mean, the last two series, like those two guys are carrying the team offensively and especially defensively for Eddie. He's making some really strong plays. So, and uh, Grady Morgan as a senior leader there, I mean, he's just been solid. So there there's guys that are stepping up in Murph's place, which, which is good. Yeah. Huge. Uh, Sunday was the big game. We mercy ruled them in seven, 18 to four. Um, I mean, everybody had a, a big day for the most part. I mean, other, other than Murph, I hate to say it, but, <laughs> um, but I will only strike only one strikeout the whole game. So, uh, that was good to see. Let's get to, let me get to the red wave really quick. Um, and see what they're saying. Um, uh, Bulldogs Bob's in here talking about Tommy Hopfe had terrible week, four double plays, two blown saves. Hopefully he broke out of his funk Sunday. Yes, he did have a good Good day, Sunday. I believe you, you mentioned that, Caleb. Uh, he, had, he had a big day at the plate Sunday. Um, you can argue that the umps cost us sweeps against San Jose and Air Force. That is true. <laughs> but still never complain about winning every weekend series. Um, Murph has been money on the hot corner, he says, this year. I've seen a couple plays. Murph, uh, Murph's ready to go. And, you know, I... You know, you talked about it. it's only a matter of time. It is, he's learning where he's at right now at the plate, what he needs to work on. He's currently working on that, no doubt. The coaches, I'm sure, are with him. And uh, by the time it's go time or the, the games really mean something, like Mountain West tourney time, or we get to a regional, he's going to be ready. Uh, offensive production has been disappointing. His offensive production has been, it seems like he strikes out the most and he seems to always get first call strikes. It's true. Um, that is the most frustrating thing in baseball to me when you watch a first strike, first pitch strike. Um, I was always told in high school playing, never swing at the first pitch. I never, I hated that rule. I never stuck to it. 
Um, I, my message to Murph is the first pitch, he should swing. He's got to change something. <laughs> so, Yeah, and I mean, uh, if, you, if, if you look at Eddie Saldivar and Rocco Pepe, th- those guys pretty much swing at the first pitch every at-bat. So it, it does work for them. So I don't know if, you know, obviously they're getting a different approach from the pitcher possibly. But those those guys swing early and swing hard, and it's it's working for them. Yeah. It works, man. It works. It gets in the pitcher's head, too. And as a pitcher, it's terrifying when you know a guy's – standing up there, getting ready to swing on pitch one. If not, it's it's going to be a strike um, every time. And we're going to throw it. Mendoza, D85. Thank you for saying Murph is under 200 and not using the Mendoza line terminology. <laughs> That's true. That, that is a pretty popular uh, broadcasting term. But, yeah, he's, he's under 200. We can just say the actual numbers. Uh, but maybe, maybe you know, let's re- rewind a bit and touch on another positive. No, Noah Beal on Saturday had another really strong outing, uh, six scoreless innings, and uh, just was in command of uh, of the zone. And yeah, just re- really strong performance from Noah. So um, you know, on on uh, Sunday, Anchor gave up uh, a couple runs. I think he gave up three, um, and you know, not not his sharpest, but um, you know, he went five innings, and you know, he looked really good for the first four, and then. Um, you know, the Falcons kind of started to get a hold of him, but overall the, the, we feel like we say this every week, the, the starting pitching is there and there, there are some bright spots in the bullpen too. Aiden Cremorosa had a you know long relief appearance on, uh, I think it was Saturday. Um, and he, he looks really good. He throws hard and he's got a live arm. And so I think that there's a lot of pieces there and the scene's just, you know, figuring out who, who is going to be the go-to guy in those pressure situations. And I know wins and losses for a pitcher is literally the worst stat and doesn't mean much. But Jack Anchor's 5-0. and oh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe that uh, our offense is so good and we're playing the Sunday. You know, he's pitching Sundays. But he's 5-0. and oh. they're, they're winning when he starts. So we'll take it. Uh, when your te- and when your team scores 18 runs, Bob says, you don't need your best stuff as a pitcher. That- Very true. Just throw strikes or put the ball in play. Make something happen. Um, softball dropped two out of the three to to San Diego State over the weekend. I believe they played a doubleheader on Friday. A um, little bit of a bummer there, um, but uh, and I think they had a did they have a jersey retirement as well go on? I believe they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, next for baseball though. Next on deck is. The University of Spoiled Children, March 26th. That's tomorrow at 6 p.m. in Irvine. Uh, that's USC for everyone that doesn't know the Spoiled Children. So we get USC tomorrow. Um, it'll be on the radio. And then because the next currently mountain- USC baseball is homeless because they tore down their stadium. So uh, it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> supposedly a multi-year rebuild. So they're going to be... Uh, at least this season, Ir- Irvine is hosting them, um, so it's nice of them. Um, but yeah, it'll be weird for the dogs to be playing USC, but not at uh, their place. But yeah, sorry I interrupted you, uh, dogs. Another know, big, you another big series uh, this weekend at UNLV, who right now is towards the bottom of conference standings. They're three and six, which put them in sixth place. So uh, definitely should be an opportunity to beat the the Rebels, and um, you know. Every team in this conference is dangerous. Um, you know, thankfully in Las Vegas, it's still a fair enough, um, you know, altitude and environment where it's not going to be a crazy ball like in Colorado or New Mexico. So um, should be a normal weekend, and I, I'd expect the dogs to to threaten a sweep here because um, they're they're showing they they have really everything clicking right now, and you know, be struggling. With this, do you put a younger guy on the mound? With a, against a struggling UNLV team, I, I don't think we. Have, yeah, I don't. I don't think we have any reason to change right now. I mean, the the conference victories are so important. I think you know get get them against <laughs> against the weaker teams. I mean, all all of those conference wins count the same in the column, you know, regardless of who they're against. So I think we keep the same thing. It's it's clearly been working. Yeah, no, that's why that's why we have Tuesday games. Right. Okay. Um, to the red wave, and then we will get to the big story with, uh, well, we'll go interim basketball and then to me, um, 
what are you guys saying? Uh, USC is called the used condoms. Oh, that's <laughs> yikes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need an S in there, though. We need an S in there. Uh, series against UNLV starts on Thursday for Easter weekend. Yes. All right, Caleb. For, for it, we'll talk. I want to address the question, I believe, uh, that Mendoza asked. Was it Mendoza about the uh, who's getting hired first? President Saul said that the basketball coach will be hired first, then the AD will be hired. And at my first thought when I heard that was this, uh, someone wants control of the hiring process. They don't want someone, they don't want to give power to any, to someone else. But then I sat back and I actually thought about it. <clears throat> and that's actually the smart thing to do. Let's get in a basketball coach because we've already seen players enter the transfer portal. The transfer portal opened the day after selection. I think the Monday after selection Sunday, mm -hmm. which is wild. The timing for that is there's a lot of things that need to change in college athletics. But <clears throat> so anyways, recruiting is already going on. We're seeing the, the wealthier schools hire their basketball coaches right now. It's going to trickle down. Now it's trickling down. We saw Utah state's coach um, sprinkle. He was hired. So now Utah state's going to be searching. Uh, so it's all happening. Well, we're all, we can be ahead of those schools by getting someone in right now, go out, recruit, build relationships. Uh, I think that's the best thing to do. So that needs to happen ASAP. Basketball coach needs to happen ASAP. And then, you know, then they can focus on bringing in a good leader, strong leader at the athletic, uh, at the AD position. Um, I now no idea who the AD is going to be. And my opinion is this on the AD and what happened with Terry Toomey. I don't, not that anyone cares what my opinion is, but it just looks like after talking with Terry Toomey a couple times, great guy, uh, was always kind to us, always took the time to speak with us. And, uh, so I don't know if it's a character issue. I don't know, though. I don't know. So in my, at my point of view, it would have to be a money issue. I don't know behind the scenes. Didn't raise enough money for the school. Uh, measure E not passing, maybe. I, I don't know. I doubt that. But whoever is hired at that athletic director position is going to have to work really hard to make a connection with sports fans in the Central Valley because there is none right now. When I I don't know, Caleb. There's there's a lot that I that I could say about it, but when Beware of Bulldogs podcast is one of the few things out there where that people feel connected to, and we're technically not even part of the university. It's not a good thing, right? There's there needs to be a lot more going on. So. Whoever it is, it's uh, they're going to have to get out into the community, get people involved, get money coming in. You're a fundraiser. Uh, you're a fundraiser. You're <laughs> you need to be fundraising money. Anyways, Caleb, I'll let, I'll turn it over to you. Um, what are your thoughts on this whole situation with uh, with Terry Toomey? Yeah, well, I'll I'll touch on you know basketball hiring first. Um, I I do think that it should be time sensitive just because of the nature of the portal, and we we need to have someone at the helm that is doing the recruiting because really, this team's going to have what six to eight new guys next year. Um, you know, depending on who comes back from the portal, um, and just with guys running out of eligibility, so. We, we need to restock the cupboard here <laughs> with players. So we, we need to have a coach in place who knows what his budget is, which, you know, whether that's coming from a collective or university, you know, however it works for, um, for paying the players, you know, you, you need to have everyone on the same page. So that it, it kind of leads hand in hand with the athletic director. Cause you know, he, 
the athletic director needs to get along with the coaches because you know, obviously they're they should be pulling in the same direction uh, for the university and you know each individual program trying to grow. So it's going to be a very important hire for uh, for the university president on on both ends because they're going to want to make sure that they're compatible. But it, it does make sense to hire the basketball coach. But yeah, it could. It's going to be a tough situation regardless for whoever steps into that athletic director role because, you know, like you mentioned, they, they're going to have to cast their own vision. So that that's another thing I'm curious about is if, you know, the Elevate campaign is going to be rebranded to something else because if that was, you know, kind of Toomey's idea or if that was, no, this is the university, what we're pushing, you know, here's the Elevate campaign, go run it. So that'll be something interesting to watch and see if wh- whoever comes in is – you got some new tagline or you know pitch that they're going to start using, but whoever it is, they're they're going to need to get the boosters on board because um, you know guys like you and me, you know financially we don't make a big dent <laughs> there. So there's you know the the big spenders you know is who they're really going to need to get on board. Um, you know, obviously connecting to uh, the red wave is going to be important, but um, you know financially. That's what a lot of the problems come back to. You know, they're going to need to solve that too. Yeah. And well, it starts with connecting to the community. No one's going to give money to people they don't know. That's for sure. All right. What are, what are you guys saying about this? Uh, it's not a character issue. It's a performance issue. Robert says, yes, 100%. I agree. Mike Stovall is more active in the community and more of a fundraiser than Terry was. Is, you're not wrong. No, you're you're actually correct. Um, Mr. Stovall has reached out to us multiple times and is all over with Quarterback Club. They're going crazy. They have plans. They have drawings of what they want to do. He showed us. I mean, I, if you're in Quarterback Club, you've seen it. He does a great job. I'll keep going. What do you think of the basketball players into the portal? So that would be Tavares, Enoch, Dono, as far as I know right now, Leo, um, I, Leo, did Leo? Did, yes, mm-hmm. he did. Yeah. Uh, my thoughts are good luck to them, but we won't miss them. They, they, they were either always injured or not very good. Um, I think, I don't know. I would love to have our guys back. I, I've, I've got to know some of them. I really like them. Um, I know Enoch was injured. I like Enoch. He's very aggressive. And if, if we can get Dono, to play like Mountain West Conference Don- Tournament Dono, I don't think there's many people that can stop him. Um, and, and one more year on the weight set is going to be huge. Um, I, I mean, of course, if, if they're going to go somewhere else, that's fine. We have to move on. And the new coaching staff is going to have to deal with that. But, you know, I, I think the way that we play and the, with the players that we had, I mean, let me say this, the way that we should be playing uh, with the players that we have we can be pretty good. I mean, we we should have beat Utah State twice. And we're running and that's the way we should play. And so and we crushed Wyoming. So I, I mean, I think there's something to be said about that. And uh, it, but if those players aren't going to be there, I think it's, you know, th- whoever comes in is going to have to build and whether that's with new players or old players you're going to have you you're going to have to change some things. So, I don't know, it'll be interesting. Um I don't care what are your thoughts. I think that Enoch is a really good piece and I would like to have him back for another year. Um because if you're looking at the, you know, newcomers to this team this year, I feel like he made the biggest impact. Um I know you know, Ducell had some good shooting games and um you know, some of the other guys like Pope and Weaver you know, made some contributions too, but overall, I th- I think that Enoch is, um, especially pairing him with Andre and actually having two big men that can complement each other, or at least you know fill in for when the other is off the court. I I think that that's that's still a pretty good tandem um, in terms of big man. So I, I would like to see Enoch back guard play. I, I have no idea. That's kind of more uh, more your department, I guess, um, for basketball X's and O's. But um, I, I am curious. Like I'm sure most people watch March Madness this weekend, but NC State, their big man DJ, that dude is a force. So I'm thinking, okay, who on the football team can we get just to be a force down low? Because you know, 
e Enoch and Andre are both, you know, on the, the slimmer side. And so they still kind of get pushed around sometimes. So if, if we can get a big man, you know, in there, that's, you know, 300 pounds. I think, I think that that could be revolutionary. DJ Burns is a grizzly bear. I think he would beat a grizzly bear in a fight. I think he could wrestle one. Um, yeah, I, Enoch's, I, I think Enoch's pretty thick. Uh, he can move some people. We have to get Andre a right hand. We have yes. to get him a right hand. I think that is priority number one. <laughs> and then we can go on from there. Um, speaking of controversy, Mendoza says, Debbie, the Fresno State CFO and vice president, is being scrutinized by the fans right now. I have seen this. I have heard about this. Um, I can only speculate. But from what I've heard, she's pulling the strings. Uh, she's the the puppeteer. I don't know if that's true or not. But if that is the case, uh, well, let me say this. The AD has changed multiple times, and I think everything has stayed the same on that board. I don't know how long Debbie's been there, but everybody part of that group, I think they've been there this whole time. So at what point do you start looking at those people in charge rather than the AD who if it's true, is just your front. That's my that's my opinion on it. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Caleb. Yeah, I don't I don't have any comment. I mean, you could take it two ways. Either she's excellent at her job because she's been there for so long, or something else. I don't know. I mean, I, I did see someone write somewhere. It might have been on Barkboard that um, you know part of her role as a CFO is to, you know, keep a good, uh, you know, credit rating for the university in terms of paying the bills. So, you know, despite poor basketball performance, you know, they are, you know, close to paying off the debt on the Save Mart Center. So having that is, you know, being able to obtain debt, you know, via bond financing for the new, for the stadium renovations is probably going to be the only route to go. So if you're looking at it just from pure financial operations, maybe she actually is good at her job, but I don't know. I don't, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and change your opinion right now. They have signed the worst deals. <laughs> I don't, she barely makes the budget work, whatever that is. If it's her, I don't even know if it's her, but that group of people, they barely make the budget work because they sign terrible deals, terrible deals. Uh, so I don't know. But what I do know is that winning cures a lot of things. So you get in the right people, you win games. That changes lots of things. So we got to get the right people in. I think we've started to do that. Uh, now we now we need to go as Robert Perez. Well, he asked, do we go scorch earth on the on the uh, on the AD program? Um, I'm guessing that's like administrators and things like that. Um, I don't know. We might have to. I don't. I don't know who's paying them though. Um, Bulldogs Bob makes another good point. Marcus McMarion. He's everywhere. That's he's part of Bulldog Bread, the NIL collective in Fresno, raising money. He's all over the place. Um, we had. Um, I mean, he's approached us. I need to get back to him. Um, you know, we've had people reach out to us from NIL collectives, quarterback club. They're doing these things. They're reaching out, getting in front of people. They're going on other podcasts, doing all these different things. The actual university is, what are they doing, Caleb? I don't know what they're doing. I, I can't tell you. I haven't seen them, haven't heard from them. Um, they're behind closed doors with the people with millions and millions of dollars, and that's fine. You can do that, but no one's going to show up to the games because no one knows who you are, and if you're not winning, definitely no one's showing up to the games. So um, last thing, Caleb. Um, uh, when it comes to actually, I'm just keep Bulldogs. Bob's got a good question. All right. What do you think of Saul as the president overall? I think he's a very smart, ambitious guy who is the right man for the job. I'll let you take this one first. Caleb. I think so. I mean, he seems to be competent. He seems to be putting some emphasis on athletics, which is important. You know, we could have a university president that you know didn't care about athletics. So, Got to say that that's a positive. Um, I think he represents, uh, you know, our our valley and our region well. So yeah, I, I don't have any complaints about him. You know, 
he's got some very important hires coming up here with the athletic director and basketball coach. So, you know, time will tell there. But yeah, I, I don't have any complaints with So. I think I think he um, you know cares about the university and is getting everyone on the same page. Yeah, I think if you're a guy that's you know an honest guy, you're not in lawsuits, you're not getting sued by <laughs> I think that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a better thing than what's happened in the past. Um, so I, I, I don't really know him, uh, from what I've seen and heard though, only good things, only positives. Um, I do think though that he, I guess not all positives. I would love to see, and you know me, I'd love to see a strong leader as in the fact, like he's going out in front of people and saying, this is how things are done. This is how we're going to do things. I think. He's a little more of a behind the scenes guy, a little quieter, I should say, soft spoken, which is fine. And that's actually pretty good. I got no problem with that. But in some scenarios, I'd love to see him come out and say, exert his leadership a little bit. Um, and then I am also a big believer in um, serving, service leadership. And if your employees are not doing that, they need to see you do that. And so I don't know if, if Toomey's not out, if he wasn't out there to your expectations, maybe you need to do more of that. I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there. So. <clears throat> but I do see Saul every once. I do see him more than most administrators out there. I will say that. Um, all right, Caleb. I, let's check in on the water polo team. The water polo team played... Saturday, they played Loyola Marymount, number 11 in the country, and they ended up losing that game 12 to 8. Mm. I got so used to just reading off water polo wins, water polo wins. Uh, this is this is a shock for me. Uh, so, water polo lost on Saturday to number 11, Loyola Marymount, and that's in the uh, Gold Golden Coast Conference. Um, so, uh, they're going to be just fine. They're they're okay. And then tennis on Sunday was canceled. So there was some rain. Um, to, today, the golf team is taking on the Oregon Ducks. Hmm. Or they're playing at, they're playing in Eugene, I should say. And they're playing, it's called, this thing is called the Duck. It's just gross. I hate Oregon. I can't stand them. Uh, go whoop their butts. Um, so. And then tomorrow, like we said, we, their play, baseball has got USC. So anything else, Caleb, that you would like to touch on in the Fresno State athletics world? Uh, well, we need to, I guess, according to our ticker, we do need to mention that there is an intern basketball coach, which I guess we kind of glossed over. Yeah. So um, George, and I don't remember his last name, so you take over from here. Or mine. Okay. I don't know. I could be saying that wrong. But if sounding it out, it would go, It would. we would pronounce it as Aramide. So, I mean, it seems like he's been getting some positive enforcement on uh, Twitter. I think I saw uh, Steven Vasquez like tweeted some support for him today and someone else. And it seems like he, he's making a public push for, you know, maybe keeping the job. So, yeah, that kind of interesting to name an interim, um, you know, during the search process. So that almost makes you think that either the decision is a long ways away. <laughs> or it's going to be really soon. So um, really interesting there. I mean, I guess he has the Arizona State connection, which is where um, Enoch came from. And I think another guy on the bench, uh, Courtney, who like didn't really play much. And when he did, he didn't look that great. So um, I, I don't know if that makes any difference there. So what what, what do you think about George? Uh, I don't know George personally. Love to get to know him. Uh, sounds like a great guy. Players love him. So if, and I think that's the most important thing right now is um, you're building a team. Who, who are, who do the players like? You have to be likable. You do. And, and you need to be able to, not just by players, but by adults, by your peers in the business. I think George can be that guy from what I've seen, from what I've heard. He can be that guy. Um, he understands he's been at Fresno state. 
Uh, he understands what goes on. He understands the needs of Fresno State. So I I'm like you, Kale. I think they named him interim. Either he's the guy or there is a long search that's going to be going on. Um, if I'm going to put my money, it's going to on picking someone, Bob, like you ask, it's going to be George. Just be good because why other than recruiting, I guess it would be why you name an interim. Other than that, I don't, why would you do it? So, um, I, I have no, pro and I would have no problems with George being the head coach. Oh, okay. What about you? Well, we kind of talked about it that kind of our only options here is uh, an up a comer, new guy who's going to be cost effective, or an old guy who has his own system and maybe needs to rebuild his reputation or something. So, um, you know, George kind of falls in that first category with the coach that's making a name for himself and, you know, looking for that first shot. So it does kind of, it is consistent with what we're saying is going to happen, but, uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm sure it'll probably get announced tomorrow or something now that we're, we're talking about it today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm sure. Um, I, like I've said earlier, like, I just want it to be a good good guy that gets behind the players, the players want to play for, and the community can get behind, and he you know, focuses on connecting with the community. Um, from what I've heard, George can be that guy. So that's it's exciting. I don't, who knows what's going to happen, though? We have no idea. Um, and Mendoza is correct with saying we're too broke to hire anyone proven. Well, you know, and you know, we have, we're not, we've won 20, we won 20 games twice under coach hut. It's uh it's going to be hard to pull someone that is a proven head coach. You're not going to do that at, especially at in the mountain West. It's going to be tough. How, how about the, the, the long beach state coach who got fired and then <laughs> just led his team through the conference I championship. And, 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 <laughs> I mean, that guy seems like he, he's got, got something going. Hey man, as you mess around and go win the conference tournament. I love it. Uh, that's why, you know, I, there's been a huge discussion. Kim. I don't know if you keep up with it, but in the college basketball world of, you know, how conference tournaments and just kind of like in the college football world, talking about conference championships, they're talking about conference tournaments and how they don't mean anything. The selection committee doesn't really take them into effect. The only thing they're good for is automatic qualifiers like the NC states of the world. And the Oaklands of the world that come and go, you know, they win. Uh, I think I believe Oakland was the one seed in their league, though. But anyways, um, yeah, I I don't know. I how's your bracket doing? Um, not great. I, I have UConn winning, so I still have that. Um, but yeah, there's there's been some fun upsets, which you know, mentioning NC State and Oakland, both fun stories and. I mean, the that Jack uh, Golkey guy, I mean, that's who I was describing at the beginning of this year. Like, why can't we just find the best shooter in Division Two, and get him up here and let's just let him go crazy? So, I mean, may, maybe maybe that'll kind of open the eyes to some coaches as possibilities from players in lower did, divisions. Did you see the stat that he took like four two-point attempts all season? <laughs> Yeah, that's my kind of basketball right there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Gosh. guys live living the dream, chucking up threes. Well, I'll say this: uh, Cartier at Colorado State and Joel Scott, their their bigs that dominate Virginia, both D two players. Joel Scott was the Division two player of the year. Cartier from Hillsdale. Uh, Golkey is from Hillsdale, D two. Uh, I think it's a it's a great pipeline. You let boys develop in D two. And then you go grab them. So I think that's, I think that's a great way to go. I don't know. And, and hopefully in those D2 guys, they're kind of just happy to be there. Like, I'm D1 now. Well, this is great. And they're sticking around. Um, I don't know. Right. Yeah. It's e easy for us to say. And then we complain about, you know, G5 players get, getting swiped by the power five. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. All right, man. Well, thank you. 
Uh, we will be back Monday at 7 p.m. live on YouTube and X. Uh, make sure you hop in the chat on YouTube. Caleb, thank you for joining me as always. Um, I know the due date's coming up, man. You're, the baby's going to be here before you know it. So, oh. Yes, at some point in the next two weeks, I will be a father, which is exciting. But um, I did want to mention it's uh, it's Passion Week. You know, Easter is Sunday. So, um, you know, Caleb goes to a church, uh, you know, west, west of the 99, and I go to a church in Clovis. So if you guys are looking for a place to... Uh, to attend this Sunday, uh, hit us both up and uh, we can kind of, well, we'd love you to join us uh, if you want, you know, based on where we attend and, uh, you know, make sure that you guys do know that that is part of our lives. Yeah. Let us know. I'll sit with you. Don't worry, but you are going to have to listen to me sing. And I sing my singing voice is terrible. So <laughs> my wife is a lot better than me though. So that's, it. we can, uh, anyways, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, let us know if you want to come to church on Sunday. We'll be happy to plug you in somewhere. Stay safe. Stay healthy. God bless you guys. And as always, go dogs. Go dogs.